Okay, so um, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, Edinburgh is one of my favourite cities, and especially on a day like this when it's actually sunny. Uh, it's a real, real privilege to be here on, on such a nice day. So, uh, my name is James Hayton. I run a website called The Three Month Thesis. And basically what I do is I try and make the process easier for PhD students. So, I know what it's like when you're in a talk like this and you're in a nice, comfortable lecture theatre and maybe your coffee's worn off from this morning and you start feeling like a little bit sleepy and your head starts going. And so what I'm going to do is something a little bit unusual. I'm going to give my conclusion first and that way if we lose some of you on the way, then it's, it's no big deal. So, in conclusion, just because a PhD is difficult and it takes hard work, that doesn't mean that it has to be stressful or painful. Okay, and this is what I'm going to try and convince you of in this talk. So this is not only my conclusion, but it's also the starting point. <coughs> so, uh, how to get through your PhD without going insane, five things every PhD student needs to know. So I'm going to talk quite generally about five different themes, and then there's going to be plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. Uh, it'll take me about an hour to get through um, all of these things, um, and then, you know, as I said, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Now, there's already a huge amount of advice out there about how to do a PhD, how to manage your time, how to reduce your stress, that kind of thing. There's countless books and websites and all of that. And the standard advice basically covers these kind of things. So make to-do lists, um, take stock of what you need to do, set targets and deadlines, uh, take good notes, write as you go so you don't have to do it all at the end, um, don't be too perfectionist, and then various things for managing your time. So this is what a lot of people focus on when they're trying to make the process easier um, in a PhD. Um, just before we get into it, is there anybody who doesn't know this stuff? Okay. Next question. If everybody knows this stuff, is there anybody in the room who has managed to take any of this advice and apply it consistently to their work and then suddenly everything becomes easy? <laughs> Not one person. Okay. So, if this is the case, there's something missing. And it's not necessarily bad advice to make a to-do list. You know, it can be very helpful. It's not bad advice to set targets and deadlines because that gives you direction. But that is not all. That is not what's going to help you to get through if you only focus on this stuff. So all of this, it's kind of like rearranging the deck, chair, deck chairs on the Titanic. So you're doing a lot of stuff on the surface, but there's a more fundamental problem underneath. If you don't take care of the fundamental problem, then you're going to sink. So, we want to go right back to basics, figure out what we're trying to do. So, first question, what is a PhD anyway? What is it we're trying to achieve? So, does anybody have a, a definition of a PhD? Delaying life decisions. Delaying life decisions. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's probably the best answer I've had so far. Yeah. Club membership. Sorry? Club membership. Club membership, okay, that's another good one. You also get doctor on your credit card, which is quite a nice feeling. Um, various other reasons. Now, people do PhDs for loads of different reasons, loads of different valid reasons. But you've got to know how the system works. And it's a little bit worrying that so many PhD students in the room and nobody has a clear definition of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Okay, how many people are actually doing PhDs at the moment? Okay, so pretty much everybody. And so this has been the same in every university I've spoken to recently. Very few people have a clear um, statement of what it is they're trying to achieve. And this is a problem. So we're going to break it down and then kind of rebuild it. So at a simple level, a PhD is the highest academic qualification you can get. There are maybe some exceptions, but generally speaking, this is true. So the people who do PhDs, generally speaking, have done extremely well at every previous level of the education system. So pretty much everybody goes to school. Of the people who do well at school, some go on to college. The people who don't do so well, or maybe they want to do something else, they leave and get a job. The people who do well in college, some go on to university, some go on to do a master's degree. So at every level, some people leave, some people move up. So when you get to a PhD, you're left with a small number of people who've done really very well at every previous level. But there's a problem with viewing a PhD that way. And that is that 
When you go from school to college to university and even to a master's degree, there's a certain consistency in the system. So generally speaking, there's a set timetable, there's a set syllabus, so the teacher delivers the same material to everybody, and then there's a set exam at the end of it, so everybody goes through the same process. And generally speaking, if you're intelligent and hardworking and you show up on time and you do what you're told to do, you'll be okay. The problem is that when you get to PhD level, oh, that's, <laughs> no, missed time that. Um, the problem is that when you get to PhD level, the rules change. And if you work on this assumption that just because you did well at school and, and at your undergraduate degree that you'll do well at a PhD, then you can run into problems. And my own experience of this was on the very first day of my PhD, and um, various people came to talk to us about administration and safety regulations and all of this kind of thing. But then somebody came in to uh, basically give us a motivational speech, and he said, you are the best of the best. You people, um, we've chosen you because you're the brightest, you're the smartest, you're the most hardworking, and this is why you've been selected to do a PhD at one of the best universities in the country. So the idea of it was to try and give us confidence in our own ability, but it actually had the reverse effect for me. Because when he said, you are the best of the best, I thought, oh, I'm not. <laughs> and I looked around, and I saw all these really, really smart people, and I kind of assumed that they were the best of the best, and I was the one who sort of snuck in. And what it left me with was this feeling that I didn't deserve to be there, and I wasn't as smart as anybody else. And sooner or later, somebody would find out that I wasn't as good as I was supposed to be. So this kind of thinking, if you start your PhD thinking that way, it can be a burden because you have this very, very high expectation. And it can, it can lead to real problems later on. So a PhD is a fundamentally different thing. It is not the same as um, an undergraduate degree or even a master's degree. It's not the same thing, but just a little bit harder. There is no set timetable. There is no set syllabus, and you have to decide what to do. So there's nobody telling you, do A, B, C, D, and then you get your degree at the end of it. That simply doesn't happen. And so the skills you need in order to succeed at a PhD are not the same skills which you needed to succeed at every previous level of the education system. Okay. So a more uh, accurate way of defining a PhD would be, a PhD is the entrance qualification to the world of professional academia. Now, it doesn't matter whether you intend to stay on in academia or not, this is the way the system works. And it's designed to test whether you're capable of conducting academic research at a professional level. That's it. And if you work with this definition, it tells you a lot about what's required and what you need to achieve. Now, if you, instead of thinking of it as the top of the education system, you think of it as the bottom of the professional academic system, so of all the PhD students, some go on to do postdocs, some go on to be lecturers, uh, senior lecturers or professors and heads of department or heads of faculty, however it works. If you think of yourself as being a beginner in that system, rather than trying to be the best of the best from the previous system, then there's a lot less pressure on you because you know you have to learn skills for a different, uh, completely different environment. So this is a much healthier way of looking at it. So, what do you need to succeed in professional academia? So you've probably heard the phrase, publish or perish. So the basic aim is to produce publishable work. And some academic systems in some countries, um, all you have to do is produce three published papers in peer-reviewed journals, staple them together, hand them in, and you're done. You've got your degree. In other places, you don't necessarily need to have any publications, but it's still the basic standard which you need to aim for. And for this reason, this is why the thesis defence is usually in front of an examiner from somewhere else. So you don't hand it to your supervisor and then they give you a mark. And some, it's an expert from your field from outside your university. And the reason is that it's loosely modelled on the process for peer review. So you have to be able to convince somebody from outside your university of the value of your work. What makes work publishable? So, well, any ideas? Okay, so most people will say an original contribution to the body of knowledge. But this is not enough. 
So I studied physics, but I could go into another field, uh, say English literature, and argue that uh, Shakespeare's plays um, were actually written by an alien from Mars. Right? So an original idea, nobody's published that, but nobody's going to take it seriously, partly because it's a, a stupid idea. But you know, the originality is not enough. You need to have a basis in the existing knowledge in the field. So, in order to be able to convince others in the field of the value of your work, well, they will judge it by the standards set by the field. So it's no longer a case of competing against people in your class. It's competing against all of the researchers all the way around the world. So it depends on your field what the standard is going to be. If you're in a brand new field where everything's new, then any new contribution is going to be valuable because not that much has been done yet. But if you're in a very well-established field, then the standard you have to reach might be slightly higher because a lot of it has already been done. So the standard is set by the field. It's not set by the university. It's not set by your supervisor. Okay? The field is your reference point. And the purpose of your work is to publish something which other people can use. So what you need to be able to do is convince people of the value of it. If you take the existing body of knowledge, so all of the published work which is already out there, then you can take that and you can use it to help you in your own research. And this is a point we'll come back to later. The existing body of knowledge has to inform your own work. And you might disagree with it, and you might be able to disprove an established idea, but you still have to reference that initial idea in order to do so, otherwise nobody will take you seriously. Then, of course, you try and produce some kind of publishable result, you can't just contribute that back to the body of knowledge. There's a quality control system of peer review. So you have to get through that in order to succeed. So you need to know the field, partly to know that your work is original. But as I said, that's not enough. Partly to aid your own research, and also to give your work context and justification. Okay? So you need to know the field before you can make a meaningful contribution to it. That's a really key point. So, this means we need to work with literature. And in my work with individual students, this is probably the number one thing that people struggle with the most. Uh, what is literature for, and how do you work with it? The first thing to say is that the literature is a resource to help you in your research. It is not a burden. But a lot of people see it as a burden because this kind of thing happens. So you do a <laughs> quick search, and you get 1.7 million results in this example. Um, I deliberately picked a search term which I knew would produce a lot of, a lot of results, but you know, you, you'll be familiar with this kind of thing. And even if you get hundreds or thousands of papers rather than millions, it's still far too much to work with. How can you possibly filter that, mu that much information and, and stick it all into your, into your literature review? And if you think of it this way, then it definitely will be a burden. So how can we make it useful? Well, you've got to think about what is the literature actually for? Why are you looking at that published literature? Is it to try and learn the subject? Well, if that's the case, then looking at recently published academic journal articles may not be the best way to do it. The reason being that that's not what they're written for. They're written for people who already know the subject. So they don't go into a huge amount of detail about the basics, so that information is not there. So you can't possibly learn a new subject just by reading a big stack of, of research papers. You'd be better off looking, well, why not Wikipedia as a starting point, or a textbook, or finding an expert and just asking. That's a far more efficient way to learn a subject. Are you looking at the literature to show that you know a subject or to impress your supervisor? If that's the case, again, just reading a stack of papers and going for sheer numbers, that's not going to do the job. Or is it to help you to do good research? And if you think of it this way, then that's a game that you can win. So you have to filter the literature in order to make it useful. So if you've got, uh, say, um, 500 search results, okay, reading through every single one of 500 papers, that's going to take you a long time. You're not going to get a lot of benefit from that. So you need to reduce that number, focus on a small number which are actually going to be useful to you, and then you can build upon that. 
So the most effective way to filter is to focus on the best papers and the most relevant. So if you're looking at a broad subject where there's thousands and thousands of papers, the way I would approach it is to look for the very, very, very best papers in that field. There tends to be a small number of groundbreaking papers in any research field, or a small number of authors who are really, really influential. And if you focus on those first, it gives you a very strong grounding. And if you understand the key principles in those papers, then it's much easier to un understand all of the other papers. So if you're going to start anywhere, why would you start with anything apart from the best? So an easy way to filter this is to look at the number of citations. So any paper which is, which is more than a few years old, it's already been through the process of being read by other academics in your field. And if they think it's uh, important, they will cite it. So if something's been cited 500 times, you should probably read it. If, on the other hand, it's a paper which is 20 years old and it's been cited five times, and four of those times were by the author of that same paper, then it's probably not that important. It might be, and you can always skim through it, but as an initial filter, you might as well start with the ones which are best. The other way to filter is by relevance. So, the more specialised you get, the closer and closer you get to your own very small niche, the fewer papers there are. So, when you really, really narrow it down, there might be only three or four uh, top research groups directly within your field, you know, who are directly competing with you. When you narrow it down to three or four, and then you focus on the best authors, you know, the real leaders in the field, then it becomes possible to read everything that those people have done. And if there are only three or four people doing pretty much exactly what you do, quite quickly you can read a small number of papers and you can become you know, the number five expert in the world very, very quickly, but only by specialising. Okay, you cannot do that for an entire field, but you can do it when you narrow it down. So it depends how competitive uh, your field is. So, uh, PhD is all about research. So how does research work? What are the skills that you need? So the aim of research is to go beyond what's already known. And this is why it's attractive. You know, there's kind of a romantic image about, uh, to do with working on the frontier of human knowledge and being able to contribute something back to the world in the form of, in the form of your research. The problem is that because you're going beyond what's already known, you cannot know the outcome. If you know the outcome in advance, then it's not research, or it's at least not very interesting research. Mm -hmm. And it's often in the surprises, the things which go wrong, the, the um, things that you didn't expect, that the best results emerge. Uh, does anybody know who this guy is? No, you're the second person to say that. Maybe I've got the wrong picture, but um, you're on the right lines. Uh, it's Alexander Fleming. So, a uh, very famous Scottish scientist, uh, discoverer of penicillin. Uh, does anyone know the story of penicillin, how it was discovered? By accident? Yeah? It was just growing in his lab. Okay, it was just growing in his lab. Okay, any, any more detail? It, it, uh, apparently it, was just, it wasn't discovered by him, but about to Oxford. Uh, <laughs> ah, okay. No, seriously, there, yeah. there's, there's a theory that he, he made this up, that oh, it might have floated through the window and then within my petri dish. Okay. He, he stole some <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard that particular version of it. Um, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so basically what most people know what most people know is that it was an accidental discovery. So something to do with mould growing, um, so source of mould, penicillin. But there's obviously a lot missing from that story, because mould grows in lots of places and people don't discover <laughs> antibiotics. So the important point is not the accident. The important point is what he did afterwards. So what happened was he was growing uh, petri dishes, um, you know, bacterial cultures, and um, he went away for the weekend, he left his samples on a shelf, and he was notoriously messy in his lab, and you know, one, of the, one of the dishes wasn't sealed properly, and it became contaminated. So he came back from his weekend away, and he noticed that there were spots of mould in this, in this dish. Now what most people would have done, 
because it was only one of his samples which was contaminated. What most people would have done is said, oh, that's contaminated, throw it away. That's probably what I would have done, but then I wasn't that good at researching. So, what he did instead was rather than throwing it away, he had a closer look and he noticed that around the spot of mold, there was a region where the bacteria wasn't growing. And that got him curious. And so what he did, what he then did, was he used his um, exceptional skill as a researcher to figure out what was going on and then try and reproduce it and then you know, ultimately this led to antibiotics. And the, the story about the, um, the other scientists from Oxford, apparently the story I've heard is that um, he actually abandoned research into antibiotics because he didn't think it could be scaled up because it was very difficult to, um, to cultivate the mold and it was very difficult to isolate the, the chemical product which, which came out of it. And it was the guys in Oxford who um, developed the kind of industrial process which allowed the mass production of it. And so they shared the Nobel Prize with him. As far as him kind of making it up, I don't, <laughs> uh, I haven't had that version. But anyway, so the important thing is not the accident, it's what he did afterwards and it's how he responded to the unexpected. So if he had been focused on his to-do list or his target <coughs> or his deadline, if that had been his sole tunnel vision focus, he would have missed it, he would have thrown it away because it wasn't what he was aiming for. So you need flexibility in whatever approach you take, partly in order to deal with the unexpected, but also it's the only way you can do great research because great research comes from the unexpected. So, when you have a target and a deadline, it's a good place to start because it gives you direction and it, it you know, kind of gets you going. But there are two possible outcomes. You can either succeed or you can fail. So what do you do when this happens? And it's inevitable that it will happen because there's always unexpected things which happen. Do you just set a new deadline and try and work harder in order to, in order to uh, get it done? Or do you stop and think and fire up your curiosity? If you just set a new deadline, then you're just focused on doing the same thing again and again and again until it works. But if you get curious, then you can engage your problem solving and creativity skills. And this is vitally important for doing good research. So when you have a target and you have a starting point, you might kind of have a rough idea of how to get there. But if you don't have a fixed process, an A, B, C kind of recipe to follow, then there's a big unknown between your starting point and your target. So what almost always happens, if you haven't done something before, is that there will be a block. Something will go wrong and it will stop you in your tracks. Now what you do now is really important. If you focus solely on the outcome, so in order to succeed in my PhD, I need to get this thing done. If I don't get this thing done, then I'm going to fail. If, if your focus is over there, then there's nothing you can do now which has a big positive or negative effect on the ultimate outcome. Because a PhD take, takes so long, there's so many different things involved, that um, you can't directly influence that result which is one or two or three years in the future. So the only place you can have an effect, the only thing that you can do, is to focus your attention on the point of failure. Focus on the actual problem which is directly in front of you. And that is where you can have some kind of influence. You have to stop and you have to think and you have to get curious about what's going on, why is this not working, and then you can maybe find another way. And the path to your final target only becomes clear afterwards. So you cannot rigidly um, stick to a plan because the universe is under no obligation to follow your timetable. There is always things which happen which are going to disrupt you. So you have to investigate a little bit, you run into a problem, you change direction, you constantly ad adapt to things which happen because the unexpected is the only thing which you can actually expect. So the defining factor for success is not how well you plan. It's what you do when things aren't going to plan. And that's the vital skill uh, in research. <coughs> so number four, uh, PhD is not intrinsically stressful by nature. And I know I'm going to have to do some work to, to convince you of this. Um, so I'll give an example. 
Um, so imagine you're rock climbing, so you're several meters off the ground, you're clinging to a uh, cliff face. If you're not a skillful rock climber, you'll find this in, definitely you'll find this stressful. So you'll be scared of falling, um, your heart will be racing, your muscles will tense up, you'll be shaking, and it'll be very, very difficult to move. It'll be extremely stressful. But if you are an experienced climber, then you'll respond differently. So you might still feel fear, but you can control it and you can use your skill in order to get out of that situation. So what this means is it's not the situation which is stressful by nature. It's a personal reaction to it which depends on all kinds of other factors. So if you see a PhD as just being intrinsically stressful by nature, so a PhD, it just is stress and everybody has to go through this suffering in order to succeed. If that's just the way it is, then you'll ignore the stress and just try and work through it um, because there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way the system is, you know, PhD equals stress. And I think this is an extremely damaging uh, but very common kind of way of thinking. And in some cases, people actually see the stress as like a, a badge of honor. So, oh, you think you have it hard. My supervisor never responds to emails. My equipment doesn't work. I have to work 18 hours a day. And it's kind of like this stress one-upmanship. But it's not a particularly useful way of operating. So, you know, maybe there's some things that we can do about it. So, if you see it not as the PhD is stressful, but I'm feeling stressed, it's a reaction within me, and it's not coming from the situation, but it's coming from inside, then maybe you can change that reaction. Okay? But you can't do anything if a PhD is just stressful by nature. So you don't have to just accept stress as part of your normal everyday existence. You should see it as a signal, as a warning sign, as an alarm, that something isn't right. And just carrying on and trying to work harder isn't the way to go. Are there any psychologists in the room? One. Okay. Two. Was that half a hand up? Okay. Okay. So um, I might just about get away with it. <laughs> okay. Um, we have to look at a little bit about how the brain works, and you know, very very kind of uh, simplified version. So when you have a level of a kind of ingrained skill, so something that you can do without having to think about it. Um, it leaves a lot, of, a lot of spare capacity for doing other things. So for example, if I'm walking, it's an extremely complicated process. All the different muscles firing, all the nerves going. Um, but I don't need to concentrate on every single step and every little adjustment of balance. So I can walk around and I can keep talking and you know, it's not going to affect anything. But if you increase the difficulty, then you reach a point where you have to start using conscious effort and concentration. So for example, if we set up a wooden beam, maybe a meter off the ground, and I was trying to walk along it, then I have to concentrate. Okay? And so I'm really, really thinking about every, every little movement. And when you reach that point, if one of you tries to have a conversation with me, I'm not going to be able to respond because I'm using up part of my conscious effort and concentration. And the key point is that your capacity for concentration for conscious effort is limited. And so if I try and have a conversation at the same time as I'm walking along this beam, I can't really do either one properly. Okay? Because one thing is taking on part of the reserve of conscious effort and the other thing is taking up another part, so I can't apply myself fully to either one. Okay? So what happens when you increase the difficulty even further is you end up in overload. So you've used up all your conscious effort and concentration, there's nothing left in reserve, and you, you can't apply yourself to the task at hand, and you just end up unable to operate, unable to do anything. And this is what a lot of people end up, um, this is the situation that a lot of students end up in, by totally overloaded, totally overwhelmed. And so we want to try and uh, address that situation. So when you need to work at close to your full mental capacity, the slightest distraction can drastically reduce your ability. So this is what would happen you know, if I'm really concentrating on walking along the beam, somebody talks to me, that's a distraction, and then I'm much more likely to fall off. Okay, same thing in your research. 
when you really have to concentrate on a particular idea, if somebody interrupts that, that thought process, it's very difficult to get it back. So your, your ability becomes reduced because you're using up part of that mental reserve that you need to apply to the problem. But what about external motivation? So what people often do um, when you're having difficulty concentrating on something would be to add some kind of external motivation on top in order to make you concentrate. So again, I'm working on the Bing, finding it kind of difficult, and then somebody says, okay, I'll give you a million pounds if you make it to the other end of the Bing. Okay. So in principle, you would think that I'm gonna be really motivated to succeed. The problem is that now I'm not just thinking about working on the Bing, I'm also thinking about the significance of it, of the outcome. So, okay, I really want the million dollars, but I also really don't want to fall off. So it has a negative consequence as well. So I'm thinking about the positive, I'm thinking about the negative, it's using up part of my mental reserve. And so now, I'm going to be hesitant. I don't want to make a mistake. So actually, it makes it much less likely that I'm going to succeed. So sometimes, what you think of as a positive motivating factor can have the exact opposite effect. And it's the same with deadlines, it's the same with any kind of trick that you try and use. Sometimes it can have the opposite effect. When you have a fear of an outcome, so in that simple example, um, I'm afraid of falling off the beam, not because of the height, but because I'll miss out on, on some positive it takes up some of your mental reserves and that reduces the amount that you can spend on the problem. So if you're worried about the outcome of your PhD, that's going to occupy part of your conscious thought and it leaves you with less to apply to the actual work. Okay. So the exact same task can become much more difficult when framed in a different way. Or it can become much easier. So if you change the way you view the work, then you can adjust the difficulty. Now, a uh, PhD is not just one single difficult task, it's multiple tasks added together. And so, if you're in a situation where you have 20 different things to do and they're all difficult, and if you're struggling to do it, then you start thinking that I'm going to fail my PhD, and if I fail my PhD, my family's going to disown me, and I'm not going to be able to get a job, and I'm going to have this big gap on my CV, and I'm not going to be able to explain to exp to explain to employers that I failed, uh, I'm going to lose my home, I'm going to lose my relationship, and I'm going to end up living on the streets and eating out of the bin at the back of McDonald's. That's going to take up a lot of your mental reserve. Add in a lack of time, so you have to do everything right and you have to do everything right now. This will leave you with divided attention and reduced ability, and you end up in a situation where even easy things become difficult. And then you start thinking, why can't I do this? This should be easy. I should be good enough. Why am I not good enough? I'm going to fail my PhD. And the whole cycle continues, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. The worst thing to do in this situation is to just try and work harder. But it's what most people will try to do. So I'm not succeeding. I have to put in more hours. But once you reach, say, 18 hours a day, only leaving six hours for things like sleeping and eating, you can't go any further. So you have to think of it in a different way. And if your mental capacity is already overstretched, and then you start cutting down on the amount of sleep you have as well, your ability is only going, going to go one way, and it's not going to work. But it's what a lot of people try and do, because they want to appear that they're putting in like, the most that they can. But there's a difference <laughs> between working as many hours as you physically can until you're exhausted and fully engaging with the work with everything that you have. There's a massive difference between just putting hours in and investing in it with your entire being. And that's only possible, it's only possible to fully engage with it when you start to let go of the fear of the outcome. So what you have to do if you're overloaded, if you're stressed, is slow down. And it's the most difficult thing to do when you're in that situation, but it's also the most effective. So your instinct will be, will be telling you, I have to work harder, I have to work harder, I have to work harder. But you need to do the opposite. You need to slow down, you need to take, you need to take time to think. If you think about it, 
As an academic, your ability to think is the most important thing you have. So if you don't give yourself time to think, then you know, you're never going to be able to work to the best of your ability. So if you think about the different ingredients of stress, so you have high difficulty, our PhD is difficult, there's no argument about that. Uh, divided attention, so you have several difficult tasks at the same time. And then the consequences, so nobody wants to fail. If you look at each of these things in turn, then there are things you can do. So if something's very difficult, how can you reduce the scale of the task? Can you break it down into intermediate steps? So you might not know the entire solution, but you can see that if you just solve one smaller problem, then that will move you a little bit closer. If you have divided attention, maybe you just need to put a lot of those things to one side and then just focus on one thing. So you can invest all of that limited reserve of mental effort into the one thing. And if you're worried about the consequences, if you're worried about failure, you know, maybe you can you know, actually address that and try and think, actually, if I fail, perhaps it's not the worst thing that can happen. And then you can relax, and then you can apply yourself fully to the work. Now, obviously, some stress can be useful. So you need to push beyond what you could do at the beginning of the PhD. There needs to be some development. But the only way to improve your ability is to push slightly beyond your limit. There's no point going, you know, trying to do something um, really, 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 really difficult, and it's so far beyond your ability that you, you, you fail, because that's only going to increase, increase your stress level. But if you push slightly beyond what you can already do, then you have potential to improve. And if you do this consistently, then your skill level goes up gradually, 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 and then things that were once difficult start to become easy. Okay. So you have to manage the difficulty of what you're doing. If it's so difficult you have no idea what to, what to do, then simplify it. If it's so easy that it's boring, then you can add in some challenge. So you can balance it so you're pushing slightly past your limit. Uh, final point, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So how to write as an academic. So we don't have time to go really into depth in how to write, how to, how to um, structure things. But there is a key point which I think a lot of PhD students are missing, uh, which I'll go into. So, um, Writing at a basic level consists of three elements. So you have the content, which is your original research, your data, your contribution, and all of the arguments and all of the uh, references that you put in, all of that kind of thing. Then you have the structure. So from all of that information, how do you divide that up? What order do you present it? <laughs> and then finally you have the words. So how do you actually express it? Now. A lot of people focus on the words. So, um, how many words does it have to be? You know, one of the common questions I get is, uh, how many words should my thesis be? Um, and then trying to write you know, 1,000 words a day, or 500 words a day, or whatever it happens to be. But if you focus on the words, then the danger is that you can neglect the content. And the content is the most important thing. If your research is good, then you can edit the words. That's relatively easy. But if there is a fundamental flaw in your research, then no matter how good a writer you are, you can't account for it. You can't make up for it just by having better words or writing more words. So the content is the foundation of everything. And you have to focus on that before the writing. It's absolutely vital. But there's a more fundamental thing. And that is your voice. So to some extent, the thesis is an expression of the way you think about your research, and the way you think about yourself in relation to your research. And it's a very personal um, presentation, which, which then gets examined. Um, to explain what I mean about this, think of the difference between the writing you did before you came to a PhD, so the writing in school, in college, in university, any essays you've written, any assignments. What happened before was that the purpose of your writing was to impress the teacher, to do enough to uh, get a good mark, to graduate from that course, whatever it happens to be. And so there's very much a sense that 
you are the student down here, the teacher is up here, and you're submitting something and hoping for some approval for the gold star or um, you know, a good mark for the A+. If you think of yourself as a professional academic, which is the aim of a PhD, a professional academic isn't offering something up to a peer reviewer. They're saying, here's my research, it's awesome, publish it, you know, let me know what you think. And so it's a much more equal relationship. It's peer review. And that basically means it's someone who's an equal. So it's academic to academic. And so if you want to succeed in your thesis, you have to think along, this, along these lines. You have to think of yourself as an academic. And that changes the whole sense of it. What a lot of people do when they're writing the thesis, they're writing for the approval of the supervisor. And that changes the sense of the writing. So if I have to impress you, then I've got to throw in as much information as possible. I have to show how much I've read. You know, and, and I'm hoping that it's going to be enough, rather than focusing on the quality of the work and actually having confidence in your work. So you have to write, as an academic, to other academics. You have to think of yourself as a professional academic, rather than being the student offering something up and hoping for a, approval to come from on high. So you have to think of an academic, uh, sorry, you have to think of yourself as an academic. You are the teacher. You are the authority in your own work. Nobody knows your work better than you do. And you have to, if you write from that perspective, it makes the whole process much easier. Another thing to do is to write your defense into your thesis. So ultimately, somebody's going to read it. They're going to ask you questions about it. They'll be looking for weaknesses. And this is a little bit daunting, but you can, there's a lot you can do to prepare yourself for it. And your defense starts with your writing and the way you think about your own research. So, if you think of your research and you think um, there's some uh, possible weakness in there, if you avoid it, if you don't mention it, then the examiner will probably pick up on it and that will be a point of attack because you haven't addressed it. If instead you take a critical view of your own work, you can preempt those points of attack. You can defend against those weaknesses. So what you can do is, if for example there are multiple possible explanations for a result, or multiple um, interpretations, or maybe there were different ways you could have applied the methodology, if you acknowledge them and say, it may be argued that these results could be interpreted in this way. However, because of X, Y, and Z, you know, this is why I'm going with my explanation, you're addressing it, you're building the defense into your own thesis, and you're showing that you've had that critical level of thought. You're showing that you think as an academic. Okay. And that is a way of making sure that when an examiner reads it and they have a question, then the next paragraph is that, oh, right, they've addressed that. That's good. And they'll have confidence in you as an academic in the way you think. And it makes the whole process much easier. So, it's quite easy to stand up here and say all these things and, uh, and say, oh, if you just do this, then the whole thing gets easy. But the course of my own PhD was not straightforward. Um, it was a very difficult project. I had to change projects, actually, at the end of my first year. And I was doing experiments which basically involved a failure rate of probably about 95%. That might actually be a little bit optimistic. And so... There's a constant sense of frustration that nothing I did seemed to affect the outcome. Um, trying really, really hard, but then you know, constantly running into, running into these barriers. And at the same time, having that background feeling that I'm not good enough, I don't deserve to be here. And so every time an experiment went wrong, it was reinforcing that feeling in the back of my mind. And so I got well into my third year and I didn't have enough results, I didn't have any publications, and I could see all the other students around me, you know, they had publications, they would go to conferences, and I thought, you know, they're going to succeed, you know, I'm the one who's not the best of the best, I'm going to fail. And so I was working in the lab, and I dropped a sample, and it broke, and it had taken two or three days to prepare it, and it was going to take me another two or three days to get back to where it was. This wasn't the first time it happened, but for some reason, this time, when I broke that sample, something inside me snapped as well. And I just had enough. 
and I, I swore loudly, I'm not going to say what I said, but I stormed out of the door, started walking across campus, and I didn't really know where I was going, I just had to get away. I didn't even know if I was going to come back. So I started thinking, you know, this is, it's just not worth it. It's so stressful, I'm putting everything I have into it, I'm not getting anywhere. And what is the point of putting myself through this? I might as well quit, because I'm going to fail anyway. And the more I thought about it, the better I felt. I've been avoiding this feeling for so long, but then when I actually addressed it, I started to feel you know, not too bad. I started rehearsing what I would say to my supervisor, my family, my friends, and thinking, well, okay, if I quit, how am I going to find a job? But then I thought, well, I'll probably be all right. I'll find something. It may not be my dream job, but I'll find a way. You know, I trust in my own ability that I'll be okay. But then I thought, well, actually, there's still a few things I can try in my research. Maybe if I try this thing or this thing, um, that, could, that could work. And I thought, well, I'm probably going to quit, but I'll just try these things, and if they don't work, I'm, I'm out of here. Right? But I thought, if I'm going to go back, if there's any point in me going back to try these things, I want to know that I've given it my best shot. Because then I can quit and know that I've at least um, given, it, given it some effort. And so I went back to the lab and I was no longer worried about failing because I was going to quit anyway. And so it removed some of that fear. And all I did was think, I'm just going to do this to the best of my ability. I'm going to do it as carefully as possible. I'm going to take my time and see what happens. And things started to work. And what happened previously was because I never believed anything would work, I was kind of undermining myself. I was rushing in preparation. Um, you know, I was constantly under this pressure that I have to be working harder. And so I couldn't possibly do my best work under those conditions. But when I removed the fear of failure, when I removed that, that kind of significance to um, success or failure, that freed me up to just throw myself into doing the work for the hell of it. And only then, could I actually do the best work that I was capable of when I didn't care anymore whether I succeeded or failed. And that was the basis for being able to write my thesis very quickly. I still had loads of work to do and the last few months were a really intense effort to get the results that I needed but even though I was working harder it was less stressful because I was fully engaged in what I was doing rather than just being I have to work harder, I have to work harder, I have to work harder. So, when it came to writing my thesis, I took the same attitude and I basically said to myself, well, I may not be the best physicist in the world, there's big gaps in my knowledge, but I know that I know my equipment because it's broken down so often and I've taken it apart and rebuilt it, I literally know it inside out. And so if I stick to what I know in my thesis, then I know that I can at least defend that and no examiner is going to be able to find a gap in that bit of knowledge. If they ask me to derive the Schrodinger equation, I'm screwed. But if, they, if, if I dictate the terms of the conversation by deciding what content to put into my thesis, then I can defend that. And if I fail, I fail. I've at least given it a good shot. And I know that I'll be OK. I'll be able to find a job. And I trust in my own ability that I'll be able to do that. So in conclusion, just because a PhD is hard and it takes hard work, that doesn't mean it has to be stressful or painful. And you should see stress as a signal that something's not right and you should do something about it. One final thing. Success or failure in a PhD is not a measure of who you are. It's not a measure of your value in life. Success or failure in a PhD is not success or failure in life. If you fail at your PhD, it's not the worst thing that could happen. But when you start to get that fear and thinking, I'm going to fail, just tell yourself, whatever happens, success or failure, I will deal with it. I trust in my own ability that I will be okay. But right now, I'm just going to focus on doing this one thing. And I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Now, um, we've got a mic here, so if anybody has any...
questions for James? I can come running up um, to hand you the mic. Has anybody got any questions for, for James? Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Frederick. I'm a third year student uh, Hi, Frederick. in sociology. I'm writing up right now. Okay. Um, it's a bit tedious, but it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you have some sort of, uh, of a kind of a daily schedule that you followed in your write-up thesis from your write-up time? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think having a consistent schedule is quite is quite important. Um, there were a few specific things that I did. So, um, first of all, I got rid of my internet connection at home because I knew that I had that tendency to kind of procrastinate online. So Same I just, just <laughs> removed the option, and then you know you, you don't have to worry about it. Um, in terms of routine, I didn't have a strict kind of timetable, and I think what a lot of people do is try and plan out minute by minute. Um, I have to get this done by this by this this time. Um, the worst case I've seen. Or as a guy who is putting um, on his on his daily timetable, I get up at five a.m. and I have three hours work done before it's even nine a.m. And the problem was that he never managed to get up at five a.m. Obviously, because um, the only time you can do that is if you've got a plane to catch. You know, you can do it once, but you can't do it consistently. Um, you know, it's very difficult to do consistently. And so by the time he woke up at nine thirty, he was already three hours behind. So he's already failed. And so he, he starts the day feeling, feeling like crap. So um, don't, try and, don't try and kind of set everything in stone, but have a kind of general, um, general consistent routine. Um, I think the important things are the start of the day and the end of the day. And what happens in between, if you get those two endpoints right, then what happens in between kind of takes care of itself. Start the day with something simple that you can succeed at. So what I had was kind of a list of fairly menial things. So um, correct the formatting on the caption for this figure, for example. And then, you know, that's easy. It's not going to take that much effort. So I can get that done and I start the day with a success. And then you can dive into, into the kind of more, uh, more complicated things. So it's an easy routine. At the end of the day, uh, I think it's important to have kind of a a closed down sort of ritual. So uh, you want to create a little bit of space between yourself and work. Because if you're so uh, deeply um, immersed in it, then if you just stop and then try and go to sleep, then you're not giving yourself um, time and space to, to kind of come down again. So what I did was um, basically tidy up my desk, write down kind of what my what my thoughts were at that time, the kind of things that I needed to do the next day. So I've got kind of a, a rough to-do list for the next day and a couple of easy things maybe maybe to start off with. Um, and basically kind of put everything away so that I kind of felt like it was it was in order, it was under control. So if my desk was tidy when I'd left, then you know, it's alright, I'm I'm under the control of it. Um, if I just left it a mess then it's kind of a mess in my head as well. Um, so you know, I think that, that was a fairly important thing. So I'll focus on the start of the day and the end of the day. Um, the other thing, um, I know it's a short question, long answer, but um, I aimed for 500 words every day. Um, the reason being that I know that when I'm writing well, I can do you know, 300 words an hour. is a reasonable pace, so I'm taking time to think, but it's still you know, producing quite a bit. So in a whole day, I should be able to do 500 words. And even on a difficult day, you know, if I struggle and, and sweat and you know, toil for 12 hours to write 500 words, I know I'll get it. So even on a bad day, I've got a target which I can reach. Um, so it's kind of guaranteed, you know, guaranteed success. At the end of the day, I've got a measure of what is, of what is a successful day. But most days, I would smash that target and I feel, you know, feel really good. So I think that was, that was quite important. Um, yeah, That's, that was my routine. In the okay. Thank you. Just, just um, a short question. Is it normal for first-year students um, to take 
three, four days just to write two pages. <laughs> Is it normal for first year students to take two or three days to write three pages? Um, Sometimes one week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this comes back to what I said about the three ingredients of writing. So the content, the structure, and the words. Okay. So if you focus on the word count, but you don't know what you want to say, then you have to figure out what you want to say before the words can come. So, I mean, some people will say that um, writing is a way of developing your ideas. But um, in academic research, there are some things which you can't just think up. You have to go and do some research to, to kind of um, to figure it out. And so, in order to be able to write two or three pages, you need two or three pages worth of valuable content. And that is possibly where the block is. And if you're a first year student, you don't necessarily know what the important stuff is. And that comes kind of with, with experience. So, what I would suggest is um, rather than focusing on the two or three pages, focus on what is the idea that I want to communicate. And then you can look at that idea and say, okay, what do I need to know? What do I, what do I not understand? What's the key point? And then you can check up some references, and then you can, you know, then you can find the words. Okay? And then you can move on to the next thing. So focus on the ideas first. What is the fundamental thing which may be missing? Then worry about the words afterwards. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I'm a second year student. Um, so this is helpful in that, well, you can see that you can be successful if you have kind of a positive outlook, at least. That's yeah. what I'm taking from it. Um, is there anything, I, as I said, I'm second year, is there anything now that I can do to kind of prepare for the writing stage? Because mm. I'm in the middle of my data collection. I mm. will be spending most of this year doing that. So yeah. are there things, steps that I can take to make that third year, that kind of a data analysis and writing, although I'll be analyzing as I go along, but the writing mm. part a lot easier. Yeah, um, I, I would always say take care of your data first, because you know the writing has to build upon, build upon that foundation. And if you start writing too early, before you know what your conclusions are going to be, then what can often happen is um, people sort of assume they know what's going to come out of it, but then the data may not support it. So you can end up with thousands and thousands of words based on a particular assumption, but then if that assumption turns out to be false, then the thousands of words are worse than useless. They're actually damaging because you look at it and think, this is terrible, I'm not good enough, and you end up in that, in that kind of spiral. So um, I would I generally say any writing which you do should be something which you at least have a chance of finishing, or something where you have kind of some, some basis, um, some solid basis to build it upon. So, um, if you're doing data collection, the things that you can write about would not be the analysis or the conclusions, but maybe you can write a bit about your methodology for the data collection, because that bit's already, you know, kind of, kind of already set. Um, if you write, for example, a literature review, you don't necessarily know until you've done the data analysis, exactly what literature is going to be relevant. So what I would focus on is, um, if you're reading, you know, are there things which can help you in the research? So, it, uh, you know, similar studies, people using similar methodologies, and then look at how have they analyzed it? How have they taken that similar data? How have they analyzed it? And how can you apply that? And that will give you, give you a better basis. Um, but I would say, yeah, focus on the, on the foundation stuff and sort the writing out later. Um, I mean, I wrote every, every single word of my thesis I wrote in just three months because I had that foundation all, already in place. So if you've got the content, the writing can follow, but it's very difficult to write before you've finished that bit. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Pato. I have two months left. Okay. I haven't started writing up yet. Okay. Um, I would like to know your thoughts about rewriting stuff, because I, I've published a handful of papers and yeah. I've done incredible amount of work. Okay. All I need to do is to rewrite it into a thesis. Mm. 
and you were talking about uh, um, uh, word limit, for example. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts and suggestions about how to turn what I already have, which is solid work, into something that I'll get a PhD out of? Okay. Um, well, the first thing would be if you've got published papers, <coughs> then it makes the defense much easier because an examiner. Well, it's very difficult for an examiner to then say, okay, this has been already been through peer review, but I disagree with it. It's already been approved. So in terms of your basic um, basic work, you've got a really solid foundation, so that's good. You, know, you should take confidence from that. Uh, in terms of rewriting, uh, it kind of depends on the format of the papers and the format that your thesis needs to be. Um, so quite often... Um, you know, a thesis chapter will be longer than a published paper because there are, you know, you, there are space restrictions in, in peer-reviewed journals. And so basically, um, if, you, if you sit there with your, with your paper in front of you and you try and kind of take one, one paragraph and then, and then paraphrase it, it's going to be difficult because you'll be kind of locked into that, that structure which you've already got. It's very difficult to change it. So what I would do is break it down into key points. Um, and you know, the data that you want to show, any figures or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Put the paper away, put it to one side, and only use it for fact-checking. Okay? So don't use it as a, as a basis for the structure of the writing. And then just write everything from, from scratch okay? in, a, in a new form. And you, know, you can put more detail in, so anything you left out of the paper, you can, you can, you can add that in to kind of, kind of expand it. Um, but yeah, sitting there with a paper in front of you and trying to paraphrase, it's, it's always going to be difficult. Um, you can take bits of it. You know, if you've expressed something in a really nice way in the paper and you want to use it, you can reuse bits, but you can't kind of copy big chunks over, a, you know, word, word for word. Um, yeah, so that would be that would be my advice. Hi, I'm, I'm a third year. I'm just being writing up. It, you seem to have you you seem to have had an epiphany moment, but sometimes yep. you just don't have an epiphany moment. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just an observation. Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah, of course. And you know, for for some people, you know, the stress is kind of manageable, and you know, you it's it's really hard, and maybe you're not particularly enjoying the work, but you kind of you kind of get through. Um, for me, it just reached a point where it was, it was um, it's like everything was building up. You know, I, was, I kind of had all of this stuff in the back of my head, and then it just reached a point where, you know, you know something, something broke, and then it all came flow, flowing out, and then I could actually address um, the way I felt about the work, and then that changed, that changed everything. Um, so, for example, that worry that I wasn't good enough you know, it reached a point where I didn't care anymore what anybody else thought. I just did the work, and then you know that made everything so so much easier. Um, the stuff about um, you know looking for approval in your writing. Um, you know if you if you just look at it a different way and have confidence in your work, then you know again it makes everything so much easier. So I was lucky that I got so stressed that I had to address my habits. Um, but if, you know, you just, you know, just kind of like, you're just kind of getting through, then it doesn't force you to address what you're doing. And then you, you might pick up like bits of time management. Any time management technique will work for you for three days. And you'll think, oh wow, this is amazing. But then after the three days, your, your original habits come back in because you haven't addressed that thing underneath the surface. And so what then happens is you think, oh, there's this amazing technique. That author of that book managed to make it work. What's wrong with me that I can't do it? And it has that, you know, has that kind of negative effect. So I think you don't need to wait for kind of a breakdown moment to look at the way that you feel about your research and about your writing. One of the things um, which simply didn't have time to go into today if you've gone through the entire education system from the age of five years old or even earlier, and at every stage the teacher has told you that you're good because you get good marks, 
that will give you a deeply ingrained sense uh, that that is part of your identity, that is part of your self-worth. And so when you come into a PhD and the rules change, you no longer have that, that way of validation. And this causes like deep anxiety, but most people aren't aware of it. You never think about it. You know, you've just kind of gone through and you, know, you follow the system and then you, know, you end up in a PhD. Um, so you don't need to wait for, as I said, a breakdown in order to think about the way you feel about the work. And when you feel stressed, when you feel anxiety, when you fear, kind of, um, when you fear failure, and that will happen at some point, you know, maybe just take a moment, stop and think, and then, you know, um, is this stopping me from doing my best work? Okay. Any more? Hi there, I thought it was great. Um, particularly, I uh, think I'll get a lot from the, the thought that you, I'm not seeking approval anymore, I've got mm. to have confidence. You said that a few times, and I think, um, I'm just wondering if there are any tips to how you actually do just have confidence in your own work. Mm. Um, I think I have a similar experience, and I switched quite radically in the beginning of my second year, and I'm mm. feeling a, it's a better a track for me, but I don't certainly don't feel as if I'm an academic or, or as a peer to my supervisors. Yeah. Any, is it just a trick, or is it...? <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm. um, Well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things going on there. In terms of um, the, you know, being a peer with your supervisors, that takes time. So when you come out of a master's degree, for example, and you go and have a meeting with your supervisor, well, my own experience was, uh, I mean, I'll just say my supervisor was amazing, um, really, really supportive. But um, because he was so smart and so knowledgeable and so quick that I'd go in with a question. And before I've even finished stating the question. He's answered with this barrage of information. He's also answered 10 other questions. And he's given me a to-do list with 20 things on. And then uh, leave, kind of leaving a daze and thinking, what, well, what just happened? And I never actually got to, got to ask the question that I wanted to. And so it's very much kind of like I was the student, he was the master kind of thing. But what started to happen with time and experience? Because I was the one in the lab doing the work. I got to know the equipment better than he did. And so, kind of in the third year, um, end of the second year, start of the third year, the conversations started to change. Um, and it had to, it had to come from me. So when I went in and I had a question, and he started answering a different question, I had to say, actually, that's not, not what I wanted to ask. It's this. And I could also bring a lot more to the conversation. So it's no longer, what I have a problem, what should I do? It was a case of, I have a problem, um, I think it might be this or it might be this. If it's this, then I need to do this particular thing. If it's this, then may, you know, maybe I can try this. What do you think? So I'm bringing possible solutions to the conversation, and then it becomes more equal. Obviously, you know, you still have way more experience than me, much broader knowledge, but it was more like I was a junior colleague rather than you know, the, the lowly student. And that had to come from me seeing the conversations in a different way and having the, um, having the guts to kind of, kind of say something. Um, I also realised that when my supervisor gave me to-do lists, um, it wasn't necessarily, you have to do all these things. It was, all, it was basically ideas. You know, these are things which, which you can try. And um, one of the important things is that not everything you try has to go into your thesis. And you need the confidence um, in any kind of research to try things out not knowing how they're going to work out. And so I, I think that's really important because it means that your kind of sense of, sense of well-being doesn't depend on, on those immediate results. I think if you can kind of get that, then the rest of it sort of, sort of follows from that. So does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can get a, a, a logical question here. Okay. Uh, very interesting. I really, really enjoyed your talk. I'm, I'm now in my fourth year, so obviously I'm, I've, I've 
experienced everything you've actually talked about, yeah. which I, I find quite interesting because I see a bit of reflection there. Is it possible to actually, I mean, you're doing these talks to help people circumvent that process and to help them get through their PhD. Do you think it's yeah. possible to do that without actually going through the organic process of hitting rock bottom and going, oh my God, pulling my hair out and whatnot? Um, I think, you know, I, there will be moments when you think, what on earth am I doing? Why am I here? You know, um, you know just, you know, if it takes you four years, your, your life has up and downs anyway. So there's going to be moments when, when you kind of have, have those doubts and when you, you, know, you maybe um, feel a bit low. Um, you can't really avoid those things. Um, and, you know, it's part of the natural sort of rhythm of life that you'll have, you know, some days you'll feel amazing and, yeah, I'm going to go and do some amazing research. Um, other days you'll think, oh, I'm so tired and, you know, I've got these problems at home and, you know, maybe you're worried about money and you've got, you've got all this other stuff going on and you feel, kind of, you feel kind of down. That just happens. What I want people to avoid, though, is having that consistent feeling day after day, I don't want to get up. I don't want to go into the work. I don't want to go into the lab or the library. And, you know, that sort of deep um, building stress and depression and it's so common it is so 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 common and so totally unnecessary you know I, I work with you know people who are so much smarter than me um, in terms of their in terms of their knowledge of their of their subject and the you know people who are harder working than I am but then they end up you know just kind of battering against a brick wall and they just try and work harder and harder and harder you know I've spoken to people who they literally work 18 hours a day and they don't give themselves, they feel like if they slow down, then they're failing, I'm not doing enough. My supervisor's gonna, gonna you know, throw me off the course. And, you know, it's, it's such a waste. It's such a waste of, you know, the most talented people. Um, and I think it's, it's totally unnecessary. And these things, they're not complicated, but nobody talks about it. Nobody wants to admit how stressed they are. Because if you, if you I, don't, I don't want to tell my supervisor I'm struggling because then you'll think I'm not good enough. You know, it kind of, it's kind of like a sign of weakness. But you have to acknowledge it. It's the only way that you can possibly start to address it is by actually, you know, you know diving in there and thinking, what if I do fail? What would I do? And then you can, you know, if you ignore it, then it's kind of this big thing. It's like the worst thing that can possibly happen. But if you acknowledge it, then you can start to, you know, actually address it and take control of it and, you know, and manage it. Um, so, yeah, ups and downs are natural, but we wanna, what we want to avoid is that kind of, that deep, deep stress. And it, it is avoidable, um, but, you know, we need to talk about it. If the lakes already died. <laughs> okay, if the mic has gone. So. <laughs> If you, if you just say, you, you were just saying that, just acknowledge that, you know, if you're going to fail, you're going to fail. Mm. Do you give yourself an episode of, um, you know, like what you're going to do afterward, you know, if you're going to fail? Because I, I feel it's very amazing that, you know, when at the last minute you turning from a loser to a winner, mm. um, changing your attitude where, yeah. you know, well, it's going to fail, you're going to fail anyway. Yeah. So just give my best shot. Yeah. How is that? I and mean, how is that make you go and motivate yourself if it's very difficult? Mm. Um, I think it was a case of um, not, so, not so much adding in motivation. It didn't motivate me anymore. I didn't want my PhD anymore. The motivation was still there. But it's removing the blocks which are stopping, which are stopping me. So as I said, um, because I kind of never expected anything to work, I was undermining myself by not doing the work as carefully as I, as I possibly could. You know, not taking the time and kind of, you know, rushing things sometimes. And so the fact that I was kind of afraid of failure actually made it more likely. And when I, when I just took that away, it's like, ah, oh, you know, suddenly I can, I can go. So if you're kind of built, beating against a brick wall and then suddenly you move the brick wall, it's like, boom, you know, you can just, you know, go. And um, yeah, it's it's not about it's not about adding anything. It's just about freeing up your mind 
to be able to apply yourself fully to what you do. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody um, talking about um, effort, you know, the amount of effort you put in, and you want to you want to know that you've you know you've really worked hard. But then when we talked a little bit more, um, we got into the difference between working hard and putting in strenuous effort, and fully engaging with your entire being with the work that you do. You know, finding that sense that. You know, you just do the work, and kind of time time seems to disappear. You have no long, have no idea how long you've spent doing it, but you're just kind of intrinsically, totally immersed in what in what you do, and that's only possible when you remove all these kind of all these kind of psychological barriers. It's not adding anything which you don't already have. It's just removing the limitations to your own ability. <laughs>